Hi, I'm Sutha Varaj. I'm one of the nephrologists at Johns Hopkins, and we're here for the ABCs of kidney disease. In this presentation, we're going to focus on complications of kidney disease. So kidney disease, we talked about, can affect how you're filtering the blood, getting rid of waste products, balancing chemicals, but it has a lot more effects throughout the body. It can affect the heart and blood vessels. It can have an impact on anemia or a low blood count. It can result in bone damage. It can be associated with malnutrition and depression and progressive kidney failure. So there is a higher incidence of heart and blood vessel problems with people who have kidney issues. So increased risk of cardiac events, stroke, and circulation problems. Now some of this is due to the overlap of risk factors. We talked about diabetes and high blood pressure being the top causes of kidney disease. Both diabetes and high blood pressure are associated with strokes and heart attacks and circulation issues. And then some of it is related to just having kidney issues as well, alone. So blood pressure control, smoking cessation, blood sugar control, regular exercise, and keeping a healthy weight are important as part of the kidney treatment plan. Now, kidney disease can affect blood pressure. Remember, the second leading cause of kidney disease is due to high blood pressure. Even if you don't have high blood pressure before you have kidney disease, about 90% of those individuals who have kidney issues will go on to develop high blood pressure. And as the kidney disease worsens, the blood pressure is harder to control. Now, there are a lot of different guidelines for how what, what our blood pressure targets are, and it depends on really what other health issues somebody has. But if we're just focusing on kidney issues, if you don't have any protein in the urine or albumin in the urine, the goal blood pressure is um, less than 140 over 90. If you do have protein in the urine, we try to lower that blood pressure down below 130 over 80. The blood pressure targets, though, will be adjusted depending on your other health conditions. So it's a discussion you'll have with your healthcare team as to what your specific blood pressure target will be. So anemia is a complication of kidney disease or a potential, or kidney disease is a potential cause for anemia. Not everybody with kidney disease will have anemia, um, but it is something that we will look at. Now, it can sometimes is referred to as a low uh, blood cell count a low hemoglobin or a low hematocrit. And the symptoms people will get are tiredness, shortness of breath, or less energy. Now erythropoietin is made in the kidneys, and that's what tells the body to make more blood cells. As you have worsening kidney function, you get lower erythropoietin levels, and that can lead to anemia. Now iron is a key component of making blood cells, and you need to have enough iron stores to be able to make the blood cells. So low iron levels need to be treated first whenever we have somebody with kidney issues. So worsening kidney function, a low erythropoietin level, and low iron levels. First, we'll treat the iron levels to start treating the anemia. So when we're treating anemia, we first make sure there's no other causes for that anemia other than kidney issues. So we look for B12 levels, folate levels, making sure someone's not bleeding. If they have a low iron level, then we'll start by treating the iron through either pills or IV iron. Once all those levels are adequate and we don't have any other causes, then we start to consider the anemia being driven by the kidney disease itself. And we can start medications to replace the erythropoietin to help us make more blood cells and get our hemoglobin up to 10 to 11. So bone damage can be a complication of kidney disease. As kidney disease advances, we have low calcium levels, high phosphorus levels, and in response to that, we have high parathyroid hormone levels. The parathyroid hormone tries to balance out the calcium, tries to balance out the vitamin D and the phosphorus. Now there's vitamin D that we get in our food and with sun exposure, that's an inactive form. That inactive form goes to the kidneys and gets activated so to be in a uh, state that our body can actually use. When people have kidney issues and they have these high parathyroid hormone levels, they have the low calcium levels, they're at risk for fractures. So treating bone and mineral disease. We start by treating the different aspects. So if we have a low calcium, we will take calcium supplements like calcium carbonate. If the phosphorus is high, we start with decreasing the phosphorus intake in our diet. Now, 
phosphorus comes in dairy products and animal proteins, and those are good sources of phosphorus that we don't want to cut out too much of. But it also is in a lot of preservative agents. So we start with having people cut back on dark uh, colas, um, processed foods, anything with a lot of preservative agents, and that usually helps bring down the phosphorus. Now, sometimes, even with the best dietary intentions, we can't get that phosphorus under control, and we may start someone on phosphate binders. And these are medications they would take with each meal to prevent them from absorbing the phosphorus in their food. So other aspect of treating bone and mineral disease is by treating the vitamin D deficiency. So if someone is low on inactive vitamin D, then we will um, start by treating that inactive vitamin D with things like vitamin D3, colocalciferol, or ergocalciferol. If their inactive vitamin D is high enough, then we start to give them calcitriol to replace what their kidneys are not generating or able to convert. Now, malnutrition can be a complication of having kidney disease. One thing that people struggle with a lot is some of the dietary changes, and if they have other dietary restrictions from other health issues, they may be struggling with what they can eat. And so when someone is malnourished, they can get into trouble with not being able to function as well, not staying as healthy. We use an albumin level in the blood tests to look for uh, or screen for malnutrition. When that's low, that either can be because you're not getting enough protein intake or you're getting into trouble with losing a lot of protein in the urine. We worry about that because when someone is malnourished, it increases their risk of infection, decreases their ability to heal up from things, and decreases their muscle mass. So how do we battle malnutrition? Working with a balanced diet trying to avoid or limit the amount of processed food, high sugar food, high salt food. And then a lot of times we're working with our renal dietitians to sort of help people navigate the different uh, dietary restrictions they may be on. Depression it can be a common um, side effect of when people have kidney disease. A lot of it is the difficulty in coping with the diagnosis of kidney disease or perhaps dealing with the decisions about dialysis or transplantation. Individuals can have symptoms such as feeling sad, crying more often, showing less interest in activities, um, and sort of thoughts of giving up and feeling overwhelmed. And a lot of times it's important for you to share that information with your healthcare provider. There can be medications, there can be counseling, there can be support groups that can help people navigate through this. Thank you for listening to our presentation today. This has been part of the Johns Hopkins Nephrology Patient Education Program with the goal of improving the lives of individuals living with kidney disease. And if you want to learn more, we have several resources here, the American Association of Kidney Patients, the American Kidney Fund, especially uh, dealing with uh, dietary changes and coping with the diagnosis of kidney disease. Thank you.